This criminalisation could happen to anyone. Uh, before it was always about the shipmaster, it's changing. Any seafarer can become criminalised. And the damage and destruction, not just to seafarers, but their family, is immense. Now, I'm not saying every seafarer is innocent, that we're as good as gold, we're angels. We're not. But I do believe everybody is entitled to the rule of law that is presumed innocent until proven guilty. And at the moment, I'm building a database. Since 2009, there's been 197 major cases of criminalization. And that is the major cases. There are thousands. Whenever you have a master who has been uh, found guilty and fined by port state control, he's now a criminal. Anybody is. And some of the cases uh, that I deal with, people can't afford to have lawyers. And it's getting this distinction between having people who believe that the P&I Club will protect them. The P&I Club is there for the ship owner, and it does help seafarers. And many P&I Clubs go beyond the remit of what they've done to help seafarers. But in other cases, it becomes a parting of the ways, and then people wake up to the realities. Basic cost, put in prison for maybe being supposed to be involved in drug running. You're looking at opening up at 250,000 US dollars and climbing. Not many of us have that kind of money. I've been dealing with cases on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, masters who've been put in prison, uh, families and friends, communities where they came from have raised enough money and in the end, they ran out of money. And so the person had to plead guilty, take the sentence. In one case, it was 10 years because drugs were found aboard his ship. He'd already served three years in prison, so he had six to do. That was commuted to three years. And at the moment, the country of where he's in prison and his own country are trying to negotiate a deal to have him returned home to spend the balance of his conviction in a national prison. <coughs> the trouble is he wants to go back to sea. He wants to revalidate his tickets when he is uh, released. How do you employ somebody as master who has against them a 10-year conviction for drug smuggling? Would the insurance cover him so that he can go back to sea? Which company would take the risk? Would the ship become high profile for inspection? What would charters say having a convicted criminal? And this brings me home to get to the thought about what is actually happening. Take it, if you had a block of flats and there was 10 floors to the block of flats and six flats per floor. So there's 60 apartments in this building and you're employed as a janitor stroke caretaker stroke superintendent, whatever the title is. And the police do a drugs raid, and so on the ninth floor of flat four, they find drugs. They don't arrest the person who lives in that apartment. They came down and arrested you because you were the superintendent and responsible for the safety and security of the apartment block. Would that be allowed? The answer is no. So to carry on with this, uh, I just made a few slides because I want you to be more aware as I say, it's, the criminalization is increasing. It's a small percentage, but it's growing. It's actually accelerating in the way it's happening. The big cases make the headlines, but so many more are taking place, and the effects on the lives of not only seafarers, but also fans, devastating. People reduced, they've sold, given up everything. They're now destitute. Maritime charities try to assist them and do what they can. And there are overlaps between criminalization being linked to piracy. And I'm going to tell you about a case shortly about this. The complications and variations of these cases are incredible. And there are so many cases that are not recorded. At the moment, I'm trying to advertise and get people to tell me more about cases that they know about 
to be added to this database, and people are coming forward and telling me. Now, we've already heard some of this. The top left-hand corner, Costa Concordia, Captain Scatino, saint, sinner, idiot, maestro, whatever you want to say. But he carried the can. But when you go through all the video recordings, and this is where it becomes quite difficult, is in the videos of the Costa Concordia, after he had issued abandoned ship, and people were gathering to disembark to get off the ship, the cruise director took it upon herself to tell people to return to their cabins. It was going to be all right. The people that followed her advice are the people who died, yet Scatino is carrying the blame for everything. And the final report that's been accepted at the IMO from the Italian administration, it's not very good. There's a lot to it, politics and other things. But it's a case going on. The Costa Concordia is a warning. As I say to people, it's not if, it is when the major maritime disaster happens to a cruise liner. It's coming. Because the top right-hand corner, the Seoul, in Korea, people in prison. One of the things that is not really said by the media, but if you read deeply into the paperwork, believe it or not, the master, should the courts decide, is facing the death sentence. Hopefully, the Korean government will take pity, look at the case, to take a 69-year-old man, he's now going to be 70 soon, to be executed for when it went wrong in his ship. All the crew that have been pilloried, what's happened to the Korean Maritime Administration is incredulous. And it's a warning to shape of things that could happen in the future. The problem that we have with the Seoul, though, was it was a domestic ship. So Seoul Aston applied. Uh, the current Secretary General of the IMO, Sekimutsu, took a brave step when he started after the Seoul incident to ask that the guidelines for passenger ship safety be applied to domestic passenger ships. Another thing about the Seoul is it's a Roro. The very first Roro that sank was in 1953 in the northern part of the Irish Sea. And since then, we have a litany, a catalogue of Roro ships. But we're told that the Roro ships are fine. It's human error all the time. Yet if you talk to major naval architects, the most stable time for a Roro vessel is, as you see here, when it's capsized. So if we're saying it's human error, why has there not been major advances in the training of officers and crew for operating Roros? The same as we've done for the tanker industry. The sad case on the bottom right-hand corner, the Ocean Centurion, and this is where piracy and criminalization overlap. The Ocean Centurion was traveling along on the map that's on the bottom right-hand corner in the Gulf of Guinea. It was off Togo, about 60 miles. It was boarded by pirates. They ransacked the ship and departed. The captain, Captain Sunil James, took the ship towards Lomi and reported. The Togolese uh, Coast Guard had arrested and found some of the pirates. Unbeknown to Captain James, two of the pirates were of Indian extraction nationality. So they put together that Captain James was guilty of working in collusion with the pirates to have his ship robbed. Captain James spent a lot of time in prison in Lona. And at the end of last year, he was released. And the only reason that he was released was to go home was because his 11-month-old child had died. He wasn't released until after his child had died, although they'd asked for it. And we have this part now in the Gulf of Guinea, 
piracy criminalization. If it happens inside national waters, it's a criminal act, very difficult to get statistics and figures of. Piracy only in national waters. So we're dealing with different factions here about what happens. And this is part of the ongoing problem of trying to make sure of what is there. The facts, not reported, unless you can have access to the media. P&I Club help and do so to a certain extent, which I already talked about. Quarter of a million dollars in legal fees. Do you have the money? In many cases, the persons involved, the families have lost everything, and I do mean everything. So perhaps time to look to a professional indemnity. Maybe seafarers have to start looking towards having professional indemnity insurance and paying the premium the same as doctors, dentists, lawyers, etc., for doing their profession. And uh, if you can't afford that, maybe it's time to join a union, a guild, an association, whatever, that will be able to give you some protection. <coughs> or people like the Nautical Institute, etc. I've been working with insurers to try and bring a product to market, but I'm not here to sell it. But as the cases increases, the CFR will become more aware of their exposure. And this is going to be the real problem. Knowing your rights is very important, but being able to contact the right people for assistance is even more important. Many times, there's a major report by SRI, Seafarers Right International, and the figures are damning. They had a global initiative, got all the figures back, over 3,500 seafarers replied, and in many cases their rights were never followed. They were uh, questioned in a foreign language, they knew nothing, they were beaten to sign papers admitting <coughs> guilt, they didn't know what was about, etc. So being able to contact someone who can pass your information to other clients is essential. There are obligations and charities that can help. Uh, to finish, one of the examples is ISWAN, the International Seafarers Welfare and Assistance Network. They have a hotline, a phone line, man 24-7, 365. And they also have interpreters available to get your message across so people are contacted and known. Because in a number of cases, people do not know they haven't been able to, they've been removed from the ship before they've been able to contact people for what is going on. And, you know, we have an industry changing. We have ships that are there. Some ships, whole crews have been found guilty and arrested. The ship impounded. We've had ships going about their legal business, contacted the Coast Guard of a sovereign nation, asked permission, were granted, and then were seized. The master spent nine months of the two ships, the master spent nine months in prison in one of the hell holes of the world. The government of the country sold the cargo off the ships, oil cargo, uh, as part of reparations. There's all kinds of things going on. But because it's small at the moment, it doesn't get as much coverage as it should. But you need to be aware, and seafarers need to protect themselves. If they don't, well, it's all over. And we've had some masters die. I managed to get one master released from uh, prison in Spain to go home because he had terminal cancer to live with his family for the last few months of his life. The king of Spain's office gave a decree and pardoned him to go home. And that, that's one of the few cases you win. And many people come and ask me, will I help them? Will I help the father? He's in prison, etc. I can help, but I don't have the uh, availability of funds to fight the cases. And this is the part. It's spreading the word and having people know so that in the future, people are protected. Seafarers are protected. Shipping companies do a lot. Insurance companies do a lot. But it is not enough. And the seafarers are going to need to look to themselves. Thank you.